where I want us to be swallowed up in this song. Not that it's a happy place to be, but to learn how to be in an unhappy place is what we need. And this psalmist does it so well. He is miserable so well. I want you to teach your people how to be struck down well, how to be in turmoil well, how to be downcast well, how to have waves break over them well. And the Psalms, and this one in particular, is so well suited to help us. So grant that we would know how to feel and how to think with you in the Psalms. Through Christ I pray.
Hello, my name is Pastor Tom, one of the pastors of Grace Point. I'll be the service leader for today. Let me welcome you as you worship with us today at Grace Point. It's great to be back again, to meet as God's people under God's word. Some of you today joining us online in small spaces with the community or with your families. Some of you are back again this week. And some of you are visiting for the very first time. We might be separated by distance and we might not be physically meeting all together. But we're still meeting at God's people under God's word in different places across the city. We're still the church, the people of God and the body of Christ at Grace Point. God by the Spirit unites us to Jesus, our Saviour. And our union with Jesus unites to each other as God's people. And so we gather as the church family to worship the God who saved us, to praise him, to depend on him in our prayers, to hear his word, to respond in repentance and faith. Also to encourage each other to live for his glory and the blessings of our city this coming week. The weekly water of service, Sunday programs, bulletins can be found each Sunday at gracepoint.org.au slash go slash bulletin. And the sermon outline can be found each Sunday at gracepoint.org.au slash go slash sermon. And if you're joining us for the very first time, you can connect with us at gracepoint.org.au slash go slash connect. Also, we do have small, s small groups meeting each Sunday uh, to worship around the city and live stream. And if you want to join our community group on Sunday, we'd love to have you to join us in one of the small spaces. You can register and join a small space at gracepoint.org.au slash small spaces. Let's start our time. Let's start our time with the worship as we read from Psalms 127, verse 1 to 2. Unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the guards stand watch in vain. In vain you rise early and stay up late calling for food to eat, for he grants sleep to those he loves. Our society tells our children they can achieve anything, and there's no limit. It's great to have that drive, that push, that motivation. But as we just read from the Psalms, there is a limit. We don't have full control. We don't have control of Mother Nature. We don't have control of the sunset, and we don't have control of death. Without the Lord our God who protects us, everything is done in vain. So let's gather to worship God who loves us, watch over us, and provide for us, especially this time of season. So before we praise the Lord with music and with our voice, let me pray. Dear Heavenly Father, let us come to you with a new week, knowing your word, your love is endless. As we come together to worship you, with excitement, with joy, with peace, and this is because of your love for us. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hi everyone, uh, please be upstanding and let's sing to uh, our great God. Um, I'll just read quickly from Psalm 84. How lovely is your dwelling place, Lord Almighty. My soul yearns and even faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. Let's sing together.
Let's sing once more. My name's Phil. I'll be leading us in prayer today. We just sung that our Lord is Lord of all, so let's pray to our Lord who is Lord of all. Please join with me. Dear God, so much has happened in 2020, and we want to praise you for all the ways you've worked in us. This season has spurred so many of us to grow in a deeper reliance and love for you. While it has been hard to physically connect, many of us cherish our family in Christ because you've made it so much harder for us to meet. It reminds us of how precious this family is that is connected by your blood. We also praise you because you have enabled our family in Christ at Grace Point to keep spreading your good news to old and new friends in new creative ways. We thank you that we can take advantage of this unique opportunity to share our lives with others, build real friendships with those who do not yet know you, and in doing so, present the good news of Jesus to them. 
how desperately we all need to hear this news today. Our brother and friend Jesus, we pray for those of us who have not been able to meet with others for a long time. No matter the reason, you made us to be in contact with each other physically, which is why Jesus came to meet with us physically 2,000 years ago. We pray for those of us who are self-isolating for health reasons, family reasons, or simply because COVID has meant our social circle is not as willing to meet with us. For those of us flourishing, we praise you for this. Please keep growing us. Please keep growing those of us to love outwardly, blessing others and worshipping you. For those of us struggling, we pray we will be a family that is prepared to sacrifice our security for the sake of those who are suffering. Lord, may news of the way we are connecting be like welcome refreshment to those who don't yet know you. Just like you said, that by our love for one another will others know that we are your disciples. King Jesus, we pray for those who are not yet part of your kingdom. Help your message spread widely and let our feet carry it to people. Equip us with words and fill us with courage. Take us out of our comfort zones, daily routines and complacency. King Jesus, please awaken us so that we can declare your excellencies and praises in our daily lives. Let our worship of you not be constrained to Sunday or community group. Let those of us who work, work for your glory in whatever that looks like. Those of us who parent, let our children hear your name and see your kingship. Those of us who are unemployed, let us use our time for your glory in new, innovative and deliberate ways. We pray that the people of this church will be a blessing into Sydney who preach and demonstrate your good news a city on a hill, and a light to this world. Jesus, you have authority over all the earth. You are healer and ruler. And so we pray for our health workers who are on the front line of battling coronavirus. While we look at how many new cases there are each day, they care for the people who have been infected for days, weeks, and months past. Each new case is another opportunity for them to be at risk, even if there is only one. We pray they will keep working with courage and diligence. We wonder what we would do if we were in that situation. Lord Jesus, fill each of them with strength and bring them to the other side of this pandemic. Lord, we finally ask that you will protect each of us from being stagnant, drifting and falling away. Give us the right words and heart to speak to the brother or sister who we see moving away from you. Let us be ready to meet with them, to encourage and spur them on, for an eternity without you is too great a cost to allow. Lord Jesus, we ask all these things in your most powerful and everlasting name. Amen. Now, we will come to our Chalism of the Week which is just a fancy word for teaching doctrine that summarizes what the Bible says about certain important topics. And so one of the things we do here at Grace Point is to read them together. It contains biblical truth for Christian people throughout the ages and across the world. And the biblical truth is taught in the form of question and answer. Today we'll be looking from the Heidelberg Catechism number 38. Question, why did he suffer under Pontius Pilate as judge? Answer, though innocent, Christ was condemned by the earthly judge. And so he freed us from the severe judgment of God that was to fall on us. Jesus was an innocent, died under a real crook, and dishonest judge, who is Pontius Pilate. Pontius fee man, then to be a just judge. But one day, Pontius will be judged by a just God, just as we all, to be judged by the same God. But in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, it says, For our sake he, Jesus, 
made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Basically, Jesus was innocent, and he had no sin. But for our sake, he took our sin on the cross, so that we can be right with God, whoever believes in Jesus' saving work. We are freed from God's judgment, because one day, God will judge the world. I'll read the question, and after that, the answer will come up on your screen. And so we read the answer together. So brothers and sisters, Christian, why did he suffer under Pontius Pilate as judge? Answer, though innocent, Christ was condemned by an earthly judge. And so he freed us from the severe judgment of God that was to fall on us. Now we have the Bible reading by Candy. Hi, I'm Candy. Today's Bible reading comes from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 1 to 11. Now, brothers and sisters, about times and dates we do not need to write to you, for you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly as labor pains on a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But you, brothers and sisters, are not in darkness so that this day should surprise you like a thief. You are all children of the light and the children of the day. We do not belong to the night or to the darkness. So then, let us not be like others who are asleep, but let us be awake and sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to that to the day, let us be sober, putting on faith and love as a breastplate, and the hope of salvation as a helmet. For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. He died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up, just as in fact you are doing. Friends, friends, it's uh, friends. It's actually good to open up uh, the Bible with you. Uh, I'm going to invite you to turn with me to One Thessalonians chapter five as we look at this portion of the Bible. Uh, and you might want to actually uh, grab your outline, or you can find that at www.gracepoint.org.au/go/bulletins or slash sermon. Uh, let me pray for us. Our Father and our God, we do thank you that you speak in and through your word. We do pray and ask as we open up the Bible, you might by your spirit, not just give us understanding, but that you might also change our hearts so that we might anchor only in you. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. It was uh, the Russian novelist Dostoevsky who said, to live without hope is to cease to exist. To live without hope is to cease to exist. We can't live without hope. We need to know the st that the story uh, of our lives ends with something better. Uh, we, we need to know that the story of our lives actually leads somewhere to something better, to something greater. In fact, hope is what empowers us in the present. It makes present suffering bearable. It makes injustice tolerable. It makes loss acceptable. It's the thought of coming and potential justice, future vindication, coming restoration and approaching justice and rescue that makes the present livable in the face of suffering, injustice and loss. Uh, pastor and author Tim Keller uses this to illustrate the power of hope. He says, imagine two people the same age, the same background, the same educational level, even the same personality and temperament. And you hire the two of them. And you say to the, each of them, you're part of an assembly line, 
and your job is to put part A into part B and then pass it down to the next person. And I want you to do that again and again and again for eight hours a day. You put both of them in the same room with identical light, temperature, ventilation. You give them the same breaks. It's boring work, isn't it? Both are doing the same thing, except for one significant difference. You tell the first guy at the end of the year you pay him $30,000, and you tell the second guy at the end of the year you pay him $30 million. After a few weeks, the first guy, he's going to be saying, this is boring, it's driving me insane, I'm thinking of quitting. But the second guy is going to be saying, it might be boring, but it's not that bad. Identical circumstances, but two very different responses. Now, what makes the difference? It's their expectation of what the future actually holds. Now, I'm not saying that if you have a good income, it will give you sustaining power in the present. I'm not saying that. What I am saying to you is that what you believe about future reality, what you believe about your future completely controls what you are experiencing and how you are experiencing and how you are responding to the present. Friends, we are irreducibly hope-based creatures. Knowing that things in the future are going to be okay, knowing that there will be a future justice, vindication, restoration, and rescue makes the present livable even in the face of suffering, injustice, and loss. And so Christian hope is not grounded in having an optimistic personality. You know, a look on the bright side of life approach to things. Uh, Christian hope is not grounded in a don't worry, be happy approach to life. No, that is not going to help you at all. I saw a post on Facebook this week uh, that read uh, with a nice uh, Snoopy Linus uh, image, never lose hope. You never know what tomorrow will bring. Now, I want to say to you, that's not hope. That's hopeless, isn't it? Not knowing what tomorrow will bring is hopeless. Christian hope is actually grounded in something much deeper. And I want to look at that with you today. Christian hope is grounded in the belief that there's a day coming that will bring justice and restoration, vindication and rescue, judgment and salvation. Evil is finally removed and good triumphs. Now, that desire... The desire for that hope is not uniquely Christian because everyone longs for that hope. Religious people, secular people, they all long for that hope. We want to know that things in the future are going to be okay. We wish things were going to be better. We want to know that there will be a day uh, where there will be justice for the oppressed. We want to know that there will be an end to pain and suffering. We want the wicked to be called to account, don't we? We want a lasting peace and security. We want to know that the story of our lives will end and will read happily ever after. That's what we all hope for. Now, Christian people believe that that will actually happen and that it will come about, but not through politics and social policies, not through science and technology, not through education and learning, not through economic or military strength, but through what chapter 5 calls the coming day of the Lord. Christian people believe that things are going to be okay because of the coming day of the Lord. Uh, so have a look with me uh, in verse 2, where we read these words, for you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. Now, we know that he's actually talking about the coming of the Lord Jesus because, uh, as Pastor Elliot highlighted for us, in chapter 4, verse 13 to verse 18, he's talked about the coming of Jesus. But here he speaks of the coming of Jesus as the day of the Lord. And the phrase, the day of the Lord, is a very unique phrase in the storyline of the Bible. It's a loaded phrase, right? So when you see the phrase, it's meant to remind you of certain things, or it's telling you certain things. It's repeatedly used in the whole storyline of the Bible to speak of God intervening, God coming in to do two things, to judge his enemies and to save his people, to vindicate and to restore right? Judgment and salvation. Uh, he comes to crush the enemies of his people, and he comes to rescue his people. It's repeatedly used of God coming, God intervening as the hero of heroes for his people. And that's what heroes do. Things are really bad uh, because there are bad people in the world. 
And just as things are going to end in disaster, right? There's going to be an unhappy ending. A hero steps in and fights for us. And what does the hero do? Well, he stops the forces of evil and he rescues us. And that's what God does for his people on the day of the Lord. That's the background to the phrase, the day of the Lord. God coming to judge and to save. And so let me give you a couple examples. Uh, I want to encourage you to read that during the week. In Isaiah chapter 13, verse 6 to verse 10, uh, we read that the day of the Lord is described as a day when God comes to judge the nation of Babylon, Israel's oppressor. Uh, in Jeremiah chapter 46, verse 10, uh, the prophet Jeremiah described the day of the Lord as a day when God will come to put to shame the army of Pharaoh, Pharaoh Necho, king of Egypt. In Ezekiel chapter 30, verse 2 to verse 4, uh, Ezekiel described the day of the Lord, of the, Lord when, when the day when God comes and intervenes and strikes down the nation of Egypt. Now, there, there are many of these passages in the Old Testament. But you also discover that the day of the Lord wasn't just marked by judgment. Uh, it was also marked by hope, uh, by the possibility of a rescue, uh, by the possibility of restoration. There can be a happily ever after ending. Now, you do read that in Joel chapter 2, verse 12 to verse 14. Because there, in the middle of the coming of the day of the Lord, in the middle of judgment and destruction, God's people are offered hope. They're called to turn and repent. They're called to seek His mercy and grace. Uh, they're called to entrust themselves to Him to seek His protection. And then when we turn to the pages of the New Testament, we find Peter actually saying that this Joel prophecy has come true in Jesus. This prophecy about the day of the Lord coming, the great day of the Lord, he says, has come in Jesus. And then he, and then he says, Acts chapter 2, verse 17 to verse 21, he says, The day of the Lord has come in Jesus, and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved, will be rescued, will be restored. The great day of the Lord, God coming to judge and save, has come in Jesus. Now, where do we see this happening? Where do we see God's judgment and God's salvation coming in Jesus? Where do we see that? Well, I want to suggest to you that we see it at the cross, don't we? For there, God's judgment and God's salvation converge. Justice and deliverance meet. Condemnation and hope, they unite. Because at the cross, we see the day of the Lord's judgment and salvation. Because at the cross, Jesus takes our judgment. Uh, and He takes our sin. He takes our condemnation. He takes our wickedness. He takes our evil. And He makes our rescue possible. That's what He does. He takes it on Himself. Our sin, our rebellion, our wickedness, our evil. He's crushed in our place. He's struck down in our place. He bears the sin of the perpetrator. And that's what makes salvation possible. Uh, that's what gives us hope. He was judged so that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Uh, he was condemned so that all who entrust themselves to Him will know deliverance and rescue. He was struck down so that I might be lifted up. But you'll notice something. Come back with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 1 and verse 2. You'll also notice in verse 1 and verse 2, notice what we're told about the day of the Lord. Now, brothers and sisters, about times and dates we do not need to write to you, for you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. It'll come. It says it'll come. The day of the Lord will come. Well, see, it's begun, but it will climax. It will come to a final end when Jesus returns to execute justice and salvation. That's why the day of the Lord is good news. Christian people believe that things are going to be okay because of the coming day of the Lord. Our hero of heroes, Jesus, will come to fix things in our world and in our lives. It comes as a warning uh, against every wickedness, every evil, every greed, every corruption, every injustice in the world. But it also comes as a message of hope because it says there will be vindication for the suffering. There will be justice for the oppressed. There will be healing for the broken. There will be a day when things are going to be made right. There will be lasting peace. There will be lasting security. There will be a rescue and salvation for those who entrust themselves to Jesus, the hero of heroes. 
Now, some of you watching might not actually believe in the coming day of the Lord. But everyone, religious and secular people, all wish it were true. Because it's the ending to the story we all long for. Evil loses, good triumphs. Evil is crushed and punished, and good is restored. We want the story of our lives and the world in which we live to read, not just, not just, and they lived happily ever after. Well, no, we want more, don't we? Because there can be no hap happily ever after unless evil is removed. There can be no lasting peace if wickedness remains. There can be no security if injustice continues. No, there can be no happily ever after without a judgment, without justice being executed, without vindication. And so salvation without judgment is unjust. Uh, the rescue of a victim without bringing the perpetrator to justice, without punishing the perpetrator, is unjust. It's wrong. It means evil wins, evil escapes. The flip side is true. Judgment without salvation is just as hopeless, isn't it? Uh, the punishment of the perpetrator without rescuing the victim, without restoring the victim, leaves us without hope. It also means evil wins. It means evil escapes. No, the ending of the story we all long for reads, evil loses, good triumphs. Evil is punished, good is restored. And Christian people believe there will come a day when Jesus, our hero of heroes, comes to intervene. And he brings judgment and salvation. He brings justice and restoration. He brings vindication and healing. Judgment on those who oppose God and His people, and salvation for those who entrust themselves to Him. And so Christian people believe that things are going to be okay because of the coming day of the Lord. And so the most obvious questions the Thessalonians were asking is this. If this is true, when will the day of the Lord take place? When will this coming take place? And the first thing Paul says is that it will be an unexpected coming. Uh, you find that in verse 1 to verse 3. Look at me at verse 1 to verse 3. Uh, brothers and sisters, about times and dates, we do not need to write to you, for you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying, all is fine, peace and security, all is well, destruction will come on them suddenly as labor pains on a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. Now, thieves don't call, do they? They don't make an appointment when they visit your home. They come and announce. And it often comes very unexpectedly. It comes at night when you're asleep, when you're least aware because you're not awake. A thief comes suddenly and unexpectedly. And those of you who have had the unpleasant experience of having your home broken into or maybe your car broken into, it always comes as a surprise, doesn't it? You never expected it. Well, Paul says, so too, the coming day of the Lord. Babies as well, think with me for a moment. They don't let you know when they'll be born, do they? It's not like baby in the womb says, here, I'm coming at this hour, at this time, on this day, pen it in the Google Calendar. It doesn't work that way. Uh, and some of you parents uh, who, and moms who have experienced labor pain, you often remember when you went into labor because it was very unexpected. It was late. Oh no, it was early. I was, as you were here, as you were doing this, it was always unexpected. Labor comes unexpectedly. It does come. You know it will come, but it comes unexpectedly. Uh, Pauline, she actually went into labor uh, as we watched Con Air uh, on TV, and we actually distinctly remember that. Well, Paul says the same thing here too. The coming of the day of the Lord will be unexpected. It will come, but unexpectedly. And so the right response is to prepare and be ready. To prepare and be ready. And you can be prepared for a thief, can't you? That's why some of you, you take out home content insurance. That's why you've installed CCTV cameras in your home. Uh, you've got spotlights that are motion sensors that, that come on outside your home. Um, some of you, I know at Grace Point, uh, are about to have your first child. That's why as parents, you've prepared, your bags are packed, they've left in the car, because you know baby can come at any time. Well, Paul says the day of the Lord will be unexpected, so be ready and prepared. Now look at verse 4 to verse 8, because verse 4 to verse 8 tells us how we can actually be prepared. And so the coming of the day of the Lord, it's unexpected, but then he, he tells us this is how you prepare. And it's a very 
unassuming preparation. It's an unassuming preparation. So verse 4, brothers and sisters, you are not in darkness so that this day should surprise you like a thief. You are all children of the light and children of of the day. We do not belong to the night or to the darkness. And so he says the coming of the day of the Lord shouldn't be a surprise to you, Thessalonians. You shouldn't be caught off guard. This shouldn't be an unexpected surprise for you. You shouldn't be unprepared. Now, why does he say they shouldn't be unprepared? Well, look at verse 5 and verse 6. It's because they are children of the light. They're children of the day. They don't belong to the night or the darkness. Now, what does that mean? Well, it only makes sense when you look at the alternative as Paul goes on in verse 6 to verse 8. Uh, Because there, notice verse 6 to verse 8, he says, if you don't belong to the day, you belong to the night. Uh, If you're not awake, it means you're asleep. If you're not sober, it means you're drunk or intoxicated. So look at the contrast with me in verse 6 to verse 8. So then, let us not be like others who are asleep, but let us be awake and sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, putting on faith and love as a breastplate, and the hope of salvation as a helmet. If you're in the dark and you're asleep and you're intoxicated, you wouldn't be be prepared for a thief breaking in, would you? You wouldn't. But if you're in the light and you're awake and you're sober, you would be prepared for a thief breaking into your home, wouldn't you? Now, Paul actually says there are two groups of people when it comes to the coming day of the Lord, two groups of people, the prepared and the unprepared, those who are awake and those who are asleep. Uh, those who are sober and those who are drunk or intoxicated. And it's marked by whether they belong to light or darkness. And, and it's really Paul's way of making a distinction between those who belong to Jesus, children of the light, and those who belong t- to the darkness, who don't belong to Jesus, children of the dark. Uh, which means what Paul is saying here is that there are two realities. Now, Paul does that as well in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 8 to verse 16. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 8 to verse 16, he speaks of the saving work of Jesus in bringing people from darkness to light, right? That's how how he speaks of what Jesus does. When Jesus saves, he takes the people in darkness and he brings them into the light. And the assumption is that if you belong to the light, if you belong to the day, if you're awake, if you're sober and alert, then there'll be certain fruit that follow in your life. Uh, you'll live differently. You'll respond to adversity differently. You'll speak differently. You'll act differently because your reality has changed. You're now in the light. You're no longer living in the dark. Uh, let me read that for you. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 8. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of the light. For the fruit of light consists in all goodness, goodness, righteousness, and truth. And find out what pleases the Lord. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. Okay? Now, can you see that? He says there are two realities, light and darkness. And out of that, there are two fruits that come out. Two ways of living that are considered normal to the light and to the darkness, to the two realities. Uh, In the dark, under the old reality, you bore a certain fruit in your life. You lived a certain way. Uh, In the light, under a new reality, you bear a different fruit in your life. You live a different way. Did you know that your belief about your present and your future reality shapes your normality? Did you know that? Your belief about your present and future reality shapes your normality. Uh, And so old reality, old normality. New reality, new normality. Let me give you an example. Before COVID, we all did things differently, didn't we? Um, We lived quite differently. Uh, We shook hands when we met people. Some of you hugged and kissed when you met people. We shared food and drinks. Uh, We crammed into full buses. We could travel overseas. Old reality, old normality. But now we're living under a new reality, aren't we? Under COVID, we now do things quite differently. In fact, very differently. Uh, We live quite differently. We maintain social distancing. We wear masks when we go out. We use hand sanitizer through the day. We get tested if we have a mild cough or cold. We can't travel overseas. That's the new reality. And then we now have a new normal. 
I want to say to you, the same holds true in the Christian life when it comes to the coming day of the Lord. What you believe about your future reality shapes your normality today. How you live in the present, how you respond in the present. Children of the light live under a new reality because they belong to the coming day, a much better day, a day of judgment and salvation, a day of justice and restoration, a day of vindication and healing that Jesus is bringing. So they live very differently in the present. Look at verse 8 with me. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, putting on faith and love as a breastplate and the hope of salvation as a helmet. Right? Faith, love, and hope. Notice that, that the power to live out an obedient faith when pressured, the power to keep loving others sacrificially when rejected, the power to persevere with an enduring hope in the face of suffering comes from knowing your future reality. Since we belong to the day, let us be sober, alert, awake, putting on faith, hope, uh, and love. You belong, notice Paul says, you belong not to the present. That's not where Christian people find their peace and security. That's not where Christian people find their confidence and safety and rescue. You know, you do not belong to your career or work. Put your peace and security there. Put your rescue there. And when it fails, it will crush you. You belong not to your money or possessions. Put your peace and security there. Put your rescue in money. And when it's taken from you, it'll cripple you. Uh, you belong not to your family or your kids. Put your security there, your significance there. And when they fail you, it'll make you resentful and bitter. Uh, you belong not to your achievements and success. Put your significance there. Put your satisfaction there. And when failure comes, you'll get depressed. Uh, you belong not to your health. Put your peace and security and confidence in your health. And when your health is taken from you, it will leave you despairing. You belong to the coming day as children of the light. That's where lasting peace and security is found. That's where real rescue is found. That's where real significance is found. Uh, in his book, Making Sense of God, Tim Keller has a chapter on hope. And he writes, um, this is the reason why he says the Christian hope is a hope that can face anything in life. Oh, that's a bold claim, isn't it? He quotes a historian on African slavery in America asking this question. How did the slaves, how did the African-American slave keep hope alive in the midst of such injustice and brutality and cruelty and suffering? How does one keep walking in faithful obedience, sacrificial love, and a persevering hope when nothing in life is getting better? It's a good question, isn't it? And this is what he writes of this author. Hope, he says, does not require a belief in progress, that the circumstances will get better. Only a belief in justice, a conviction that the wicked will suffer, that wrongs will be made right, that the underlining order of things is not flouted with impunity, that is, evil will be punished, good will triumph. Hope that stands up to and enables us to face the worst depends on faith in something that transcends this world and this life and is not available to those living within a worldview that denies the supernatural. Howard Thurman, an African-American scholar at Boston University, writes that it's not the Christian hope that weakened the slaves' self-respect or made them doormats. Uh, it's not the Christian hope uh, that weakened their ability to face their oppressors or captors. Christian hope does not make you a doormat. It makes you resilient in the face of adversity. That's what it does. He writes, it taught people how to ride high in life, to look squarely in the face those facts that argue most dramatically against all hope, and to use those facts as a raw material out of which they fashion a hope that their environment with all its cruelty could not crush. Why could nothing destroy their hope? It was because it was otherworldly. It wasn't based on the present circumstances. It lay in the future of God. 
it lay in the coming day of the Lord, the coming of judgment and vindication, the coming of justice and restoration, a day of vindication and healing. Now friends, consider the secular answer to hope in the face of suffering and adversity. Consider what the secular says. The secular says, there's nothing beyond this life and this world. There'll never be a judgment day when things, where wrongs will be made right. There'll never, there'll never be a future world where your sick and broken body will be restored. There'll never be vindication for the injustice or the abuse you've suffered. Why? Because this life is all there is. When you die, you die and that's it. So, the secular says, our only real hope for a better world is improved social policy. That will give us justice, peace, and security. That will eliminate wickedness and evil. Our real hope for a better world is improved education. That will eradicate poverty and encourage acceptance and understanding. Our real hope for a better world is science and technology because that will eliminate cancer, sickness, and disease, and it'll prolong life. That's where you need to put your hope. But we haven't got there yet. So for now, until we get there, keep your head high in your suffering. Be strong when wronged. Don't give in to despair when things are hard. Well, that's the secular answer to hope in the face of suffering and adversity. Now, I have to say, it's incredibly optimistic, but powerless. It was an uh, atheist philosopher, Nietzsche, who was supposed to have said, hope in reality is the, is the worst kind of evil because it prolongs the torment of man. Hope in reality is the worst of, all rea uh, worst of all evils because it prolongs the torment of man. And he's right, because uh, putting your hope in the present just prolongs your pain and suffering. But Nietzsche, his solution isn't much help either. Because Nietzsche's solution in the face of suffering and adversity is this. He says, the solution, he says, is to rise above our reality, right? The reality is bad, so you need to rise above your reality. He says, we must be supermen and superwomen in the face of adversity and suffering and injustice. We must live by our own values. We must delight in our superiority and take pity on the weak. We must, if necessary, hurt people in the name of achieving great things. We must accept that suffering can be a necessary evil. We must use culture to raise the mentality of the society around us and beyond. We must be strong like Superman. That's putting hope in yourself, in your strength, or as Nietzsche says, your will to power. Now that's great if you're strong, that's great if you're powerful, but most of us aren't, are we? Certainly not in the face of adversity and suffering, but that's another secular answer to hope in the face of suffering and adversity. And again, I have to say, it's incredibly optimistic, but powerless. You see, many believe, rightly, that it's hope that sustains people through suffering. Uh, in the Greek mythical story of Pandora's box, many of you know the story, uh, by opening the box, Pandora releases great evil into the world, right? A whole host of things, death, Envy, hate, greed, and illness. But at the bottom of the box, the very last thing to emerge out of Pandora's box is hope. It's the optimism of hope that sustains us through suffering, pain, injustice, loss, disappointment, frustration in life. But we all know this as well, don't we? That not all hope is created equal. Do you know that? Not all hope is created equal. Optimism does not always have the power to sustain people through suffering. Tell the suffering. Put your hope in social policy, in education, in science and technology. Here is the power that will sustain you in your suffering. Uh, optimistic, but powerless. Tell the suffering. Put your hope in yourself, right? You can will yourself to power, to rise above your suffering and adversity. That will sustain you. Again, optimistic but powerless. Friends, let me ask you a question. What gives you hope? What gives you hope? Has it actually got the power to sustain you through suffering, pain, injustice, loss, disappointment, and frustration in life? Now, here's a question worth asking people around you this week. In a painfully broken world, what gives you hope? Why don't you ask someone that this week? Right? It, might, uh, it might lead to a conversation about where people find their hope. In a painfully broken world, what gives you hope? 
Christianity says there's a day coming when God will come to execute judgment and salvation through Jesus. There will be a day of justice and restoration. There will be a day of vindication and healing. That's good news because it says to people who think they can get away with evil that they won't. That's good news if you're on the receiving end of injustice because there will be vindication. That's good news if your health is failing because it says there'll be healing and restoration. That's good news because someone is going to come to execute justice and salvation for you forever. And so Christian hope is grounded in the coming day of the Lord to judge and to save, to make right and to restore. Now, if that's true, it changes everything in our lives, doesn't it? Knowing my future reality actually changes my normality today, how I will live today. And so verse 6 actually says, let us be awake and sober. And then verse 8, since we belong to the day, let us be sober, putting on faith and love as a breastplate and the hope of salvation as a helmet. Notice preparing for the day of the Lord is so unassuming. Put on faith, love, and hope. Paul doesn't say, Jesus is coming back. Quickly, sell everything. Give to ministry because the day of the Lord is coming. He doesn't say, quick, get as much as you can out of life before Jesus comes. Neither does he say, don't worry about work and study. The day of the Lord is coming. So what does it matter whether you work or study or put any effort into the things you do? He doesn't say that. And so notice he does not say, disconnect. Why bother with anything? He doesn't say as well, seize the day, max out life because it's all going to end. A bit of a technical difficulty there. Battery is running out on the live stream, but that's okay. But notice what he says. He doesn't say, indulge while you can. He doesn't say, disconnect. Why bother with anything? He doesn't say, carpe diem, seize the day. He doesn't say, bunker down, sit and wait. No. Being in the light, notice, assumes activity. Being a child of the day assumes work, activity. Being awake and sober assumes activity. And it's very unassuming activity, isn't it? Clothe yourself, he says, with faith, love, and hope as you go about life. As you go about work, as you parent, uh, as you teach your children, as you manage your business, as you do your chores, as you carry out your responsibilities, as a mom and dad, as a student, as a worker, he says, clothe yourself with faith, love, and hope. And the Thessalonians, you know, in this book have already been living like this. Uh, chapter 1, verse 3, Paul gives thanks for them. Why? because the fruit of the gospel has been visibly evident in their lives. Uh, they, they, their lives have already been marked by faith and love and hope. Uh, we read in chapter 1, verse 3, of this very unassuming fruit, so ordinary yet extraordinary. We remember before our God and Father, your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. It's so unassuming and ordinary, isn't it, to prepare for the coming day of the Lord. He says, prepare by pursuing these three things as children of the Lord. Walk in obedience to Him, a trusting obedience, a sacrificial love for others the way Jesus has loved you, and a persevering or enduring hope in what Jesus has promised you. And future, the future coming day of the Lord should empower these three things. Now, I want to say to you, our problem is that far too many of us are living in the dark, asleep, intoxicated with the present. And so when you look at verse 6, I suspect, even as Christian people, many of us are more like the others in verse 6. Can you see the others in verse 6? Notice what Paul says, So then let us not be like others who are asleep. Verse 7, For those who sleep, sleep at night. And those who get drunk, get drunk at night. They're asleep because they're not prepared. They're intoxicated by other things. And so our problem is not that we think too much of the return of Jesus, we think too little of His return. It doesn't feature in our lives. It's not on the horizon of our lives. It doesn't empower us in the present. It's not part of the landscape of the circumstances we find ourselves in. And so, you know, for some of you, it's no wonder your life is always overtaken by despair when adversity strikes, when sickness comes, when disappointment fails. Why? 
because that is not your future reality. That's not on the horizon of your life. Church, look to the coming day of the Lord. He will judge and save. He will make things right. He will give you much more than what has been taken from you. That's what will give you power to endure. You can endure with hope whatever you're going through because He will give back much more than what has been taken from you. It's, it's no wonder many of us, we live our life selfishly only serving ourselves. We hold on tightly to what we have. We will not share and we will not serve. We think we're going to lose out if we're generous. We're busy grabbing at things because we believe they will give us peace and security, confidence and significance. We love ourselves more than we love others. Church, look to the coming day of the Lord. He will judge and He will save. He will make things right and restore. And He will give you much more than what you will ever sacrifice in loving others. You can love sacrificially and unconditionally because He will give back to you much more than what has been taken from you. It's no wonder many of us live our lives with no desire for godliness or obedience or to please Him. Why? Because we're so intoxicated with the present. We live our lives in obedience and submission to people, possessions, and pursuits, believing they will give us peace and security, significance and confidence. And so the horizon of our lives never extends beyond this world and this life and this situation that we find ourselves in. And so we live our lives putting our faith, our trust, our obedience in people, possessions, and pursuits. We march to the obedient drumbeat of peace and security in the present. No wonder there is no desire for godliness or obedience or a desire to please God. Church, look to the coming day of the Lord. He will judge and save. He will make things right and restore. He will give you more than the present peace and security you're looking for. You can walk in obedience even when there is no peace and security because He'll give you a much greater peace and security. So how does one prepare for the coming day of the Lord? Well, by grasping the reality that you belong to the coming day. There is a day marked by judgment and salvation, vindication and restoration. So put on faith, love, and hope in your life. Put on an obedient faith when tempted. Put on uh, love when rejected. Uh, put on uh, perseverance when suffering comes. Church, if that is our future reality, we must clothe ourselves in all that we do in faith, love, and hope. The coming of the day will be unexpected, but we prepare for it in a very unassuming way, don't we? Clothing ourselves with an obedient faith, a sacrificial love, and a persevering hope in whatever you do, and in whatever situation you find yourself in. But Paul doesn't end there. Have a look with me at verse 9 and verse 10. He ends by reminding the Thessalonians that the coming day of the Lord brings an unchanging salvation. It brings an unchanging salvation for us, whether we live or die, whatever the circumstances. He says, whatever happens, this is your future, your destiny, your inheritance. Look at verse 9, verse 10. For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. He died for us so that whether we are awake, that is alive, or asleep, dead, we may live together with Him. Notice how Paul looks forward and reminds us of the coming day of the Lord. He says, yes, it's going to bring wrath. Yes, there will be judgment. God will execute justice. But notice verse 9. It will also be a day where we will receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Notice again where hope is grounded. It's grounded in the coming of the Lord, the day of the Lord. He says, notice it's grounded in what the coming day of the Lord brings. Your salvation, your rescue, your restoration, your healing through Jesus Christ. And notice how it comes. Paul looks back at the cross, doesn't he? Because there our judgment for sin, for rebellion, for wickedness, our evil was paid. There at the cross, judgment and salvation have met. That's why verse 10 says, Jesus died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with Him when He comes. Friends, He has dealt with your judgment, your sin, your rebellion, your evil, your wickedness at the cross. He has saved. And when the day of the Lord comes, He will save forever. He has saved, He will save 
you will receive, he says, your appointed salvation because someone has already taken the judgment for you. And so the day of the Lord brings an unchanging salvation. Whatever happens in your life, whatever pain you're going through right now, whatever injustice you're experiencing, whatever loss you're feeling, whatever suffering you're going through, there will be vindication, there will be restoration, there will be healing. And it is coming because of Jesus who died for you. Look at your unchanging salvation. It's coming because of Jesus who died for you. Uh, in your outlines, I've put down the Heidelberg Catechism, question 52. And that catechism reads, What comfort is it to you that Christ will come to judge the living and the dead? Why is judgment a comfort? Good question, isn't it? And the answer in all my sorrow and persecution, in all my injustice, in all my pain and suffering, in all my adversity, notice what the answer is. I lift up my head and eagerly await my Savior, Jesus Christ. I want a rescuer. A Savior who has come as judge from heaven, the very same person who before at the cross has submitted himself to the judgment of God for my sake, in my place. And he's removed all the curse from me. And then notice, he will cast all his and my enemies into everlasting condemnation. There will be justice. There will be vindication. But he will take me and all his chosen ones to himself into heavenly joy and glory. You see, the coming of the day of the Lord is hope for the world and hope for us, whatever our circumstances, whatever happens in our lives. Because it says, we have a Savior who came to be judged. He has come. He has died at the cross. He has taken our judgment. He has saved. And He will come again to execute justice and salvation for you. There will be vindication, restoration, and healing. So trust Him. Church, you belong to the coming day of the Lord, not to the present. It will be an unexpected coming, so be prepared. It will take a very unassuming preparation. Clothe yourself with an obedient faith, a sacrificial love, and a persevering love in all you do in life. Let faith, love, and hope touch and clothe everything you do in your life each day. That's how you prepare. And it will bring an unchanging salvation. Because whatever the circumstances, whatever happens in your life, there will be vindication, there will be restoration, there will be healing there will be a salvation. He has saved in Jesus who died for you, and He will save when He comes for you. So trust Him. And so church, as verse 11 says, encourage one another and build each other up with these truths. Let me pray for us. Our Father and our God, we come in repentance because even though we are children of the light, we are often asleep and intoxicated with the present. We live with our eyes fixed on the present when we should be looking to the coming day you promise. It's no wonder our lives are filled with such despair and suffering, self-centeredness instead of sacrificial love, and we have such little concern for obedience and godliness. Forgive us, we pray. Give us eyes to find our hope in the coming day of the Lord. Help us prepare by living as men and women who belong to that great day. Clothe us with an obedient faith a sacrificial love and a persevering hope in all that we do. We thank you that there will be a day of vindication, restoration, healing, and salvation because of Jesus who died for us. And so help us keep trusting you, whatever is happening and whatever happens in our lives. Amen. Please be upstanding. Uh, let's sing some songs. Oh, a song in response to the word that we just heard. Let's sing We Belong. We belong to the day, to the day that is to come when the night falls away and our Savior will return for the glory of the King is in our hearts on that day we will be seen for what we are let's sing we belong we belong to the day let us journey in the light put 
be seated. The Lord's Prayer is a prayer Jesus taught his disciples to pray in the Gospels. It's a prayer reminding us that God is our Father and that he's sovereign in our lives. It's a prayer seeking his glory and his kingdom in our world. His provision for all our needs, his, for, his for forgive, forgiveness for our sins and his protection from temptation and evil. Join with me as we pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil, from the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Now I invite Pastor Eugene to close the service. Friends, as we... Friends, uh, as... Let me uh, remind you that we are not a people without God. We're, we're not a people without hope. And we are certainly not a people without a community. And we are certainly not a people without a future. Uh, let me encourage you uh, through the words of 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. The Apostle Paul writes, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept sound and blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. Amen. God bless you for the coming week.
Father, I want us to be swallowed up in this song. Not that it's a happy place to be, but to learn how to be in an unhappy place is what we need. And this psalmist does it so well. He is miserable so well. I want you to teach your people how to be struck down well, how to be in turmoil well, how to be downcast well, how to have waves break over them well. And the Psalms, and this one in particular, is so well suited to help us. So grant that we would know how to feel and how to think with you in the Psalms. In Christ I pray. Amen. 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 down.